Thank you all. Good morning. Welcome to Kowali Days 2012 in beautiful Austin, Texas. I'm Jennifer Foudy, the Executive Director of the Kowali Foundation, and I'm so pleased to have you all here. Um, it's not because it's in Austin that we started the general session later this year than normal. We heard really good feedback from all of you that let's not do it at 8 o'clock in the morning. So I hope this is helpful, and seeing all of your bright and shining faces makes us feel good. So welcome. This is our biggest Kowali days yet. Um, as of this morning, before the few walk-ins came, we have 834 attendees, but I think the really impressive thing is the paren of 134 different organizations, either higher ed or supporting um, commercial partners. We represent 40 U.S. states in the audience and eight countries, um, including uh, some folks from South Africa, Germany, the UK, and we have a wonderful colleague here all the way from Japan. So, welcome to all of you. Thank you. A, a, a clap to you all, because this is a community effort, as you all know. I want to give a big shout out to our sponsor for this general session, um, eThority. I know many of you have started to look at how you can have commercial uh, partners join in your analysis, your implementation, and your strategic path for Kowali. And eThority is one of those, and we appreciate their sponsorship of this general session today. Thank you, eThority. I do also, though, want to mention our other Kowali Day sponsors before we get into the event. Our platinum sponsor, and you see it on your beautiful t-shirt, um, RSmart. Our two gold sponsors, the Vontech and Navigator Management Partners. Our silver sponsors, HTC, NetApp, eThority again, v VMware, um, Higher Ed Business Intelligence, and Perceptive Software. And last but certainly not least, our bronze sponsors, AssetWorks, Pyracle, MySQL and the Maher Group. And so these guys come and help us financially, but also help us as part of the community in building the commercial ecosystem that makes us successful. So thanks to all the sponsors. You're much appreciated. Now, hopefully, when you sat down in your chair, you didn't get a surprise and you looked first. <laughs> two sets of chopsticks this year, and you might thought two. We've seen chopsticks before at Kowali Days, so there's a reason for that. You have the lighter pair that have a very special uh, phrase on it in recognition of our Kowali Coeus team who delivered 5.0, which is the functional equivalency. For those of you who haven't been involved, FE, we've got to have acronyms, right? FE, functional equivalency to the MIT COEUS, which is a big deal. This was delivered in June, and so for this Kowali Days, our tradition is Thanks to Kowali Coeus, you did it! Yay! <laughs> and hold on to that brown pair of chopsticks for later, foreshadowing there. Um, there's no printed program this year. You have a very small flyer, and we went green. We've been talking about it for a few years. And one of the reasons we were able to do it this year is because of our incredible mobility app brought to you by the Kowali Mobility Team. They've packaged a conference app, which you are going to begin seeing at other conferences you attend as well. But of course, here at Kowali Days, we obviously have our great mobile app. It has the entire details of the session, and the attendees, the activities, and it's also where you do your evaluations. So when you're attending a session, you just need to go to the mobile app, click on the evaluation part of it, and give us your feedback. We use your feedback every year to make the conference better, so please do the evaluations for our sessions. You can also view social activities, and you can post social activities. So if you plan something fun, I know it's hard to find fun in Austin, but if you're planning something fun, <laughs> post it out there, get some people going, network, and meet new people. So special thanks to that great Kowali Mobility team. They are terrific. Um, another thing, we welcome our newcomers. 
you know, every year at Kowali Days, we have some of you old timers that we see year after year, and it's nice to get back together with you. But the whole point of Kowali is we're a growing community. And so all of you people who are here for the first time, I'm going to make you do it. Stand up and let us welcome you, you newcomers. We're so thrilled. To Look at you. You're wonderful. Welcome. Please seek us out, the people that you're meeting here in these sessions, and network with us. The importance of this Kowali Days is not just to attend sessions and listen, but to meet everybody and learn who the community is. Now I'm going to introduce to you maybe the most important person in the room today, Ms. Lori Schultz, who is responsible for this whole thing. She is our conference chair for Kowali Days 2012. She's from the University of Arizona and was one of those people responsible for the success of our Kowali Coeus release back in June. Without her, we couldn't have done it. She's one of our functional gurus, along with many of others I see in the audience. So with no further ado, our wonderful conference chair this year, Lori Schultz. Thank you very much. And you know, since we're in Austin, we've already said our good mornings, but we have not, we have not said our buenos dias. So buenos dias y bienvenidos a Kowali Days. And I'm glad you're here. I'm going to change this photo because it looks a little too much like I'm running for office. <laughs> it's not really my gig. Um, you know, when I, when I was thinking about what I wanted to say today, and I keep saying this, many of you have said this, have heard me say this before. Kowali is about all of you, and the people who are standing up who are newcomers, the people who have been here for a long time, my colleagues that I've worked with for the past, I think it's almost eight years now, it's about the people who are working together to make something. And none of us are anything at all if we're not working together to make something that helps us achieve some goal together. I see that with Kowali Days, with all of the projects we're, ma we're making, all of the things we're doing, whether it's from each of the software packages we make, you know, Kowali Coeus or Financials or Rice or Student or KPME or Olay or Ready, and I know I'm forgetting somebody because we've grown so much since I started, that uh, the best thing about it is making something together, working co and collaborating together to make this conference, to make software, and to just get together in a great place like Austin to talk about the wonderful things we're doing and how we can share them with you. You know, Jennifer mentioned some of the things about Kowali Days, and you know, if, if I could say anything about Kowali Days for me is I wanted this conference to be one I wanted to attend as well. So some of the changes and things we made were around making those connections and those collaborations easier with the folks that are making this software. Hopefully you'll become some of those people as well, especially the newcomers who are here for the first time. I mean, the mobile app um, for me bears mentioning again because I honestly find something great about it every time I open it. The KME team did a great job. So aside from the program and the evaluations and being able to schedule uh, social activities on the app, it's a great way to engage with the conference right in your pocket. It's easier to flip through than a 40-page program that's out of date a week after it's printed. So thanks to the KMA team, and I, th I hope you're all using it and downloading it. We had uh, th 13 pre-conferences covering mo nearly all Kowali products on, sa on Sunday, yesterday. Over today and tomorrow, we have over 120 concurrent sessions. I think that this Kowali Days presents the greatest array and best balance of, of product tracks that we've had to date. And so there, there's a lot of work that's been done by the track chairs and the individual presenters to bring this to you. So I, I encourage you to thank them directly because they worked very hard. In addition to the concurrent sessions and those opportunities to, uh, to speak to people and ask questions, we introduced three new session types this year. They're really geared toward conversation and geared less towards a PowerPoint with a talking head at a podium like I'm doing right now. Um, and, and those are the fishbowl session, the speed geeking, and the knowledge cafe. And those are really about getting you closer to the people who are experts in the community, whichever community holds your, your interest. Jennifer mentioned the ambassador program. You know, last night we had a nice overview of all the of all the product of all the projects from um, the people who are experts in those fields and matching them up with newcomers. If you see anyone with an ambassador tag, like the one I've got here, those are the folks that can help you and help you find the folks you need to connect with if you're looking for someone in particular. So please flag them down and ask questions. We extended our break in networking time so you have more time to chat. 
And we've also got the Collaboration Showcase. You've probably seen the tables out on the fourth floor where we've got uh, KCAs and others showing what they've done with different Kuali products, and they're perfectly happy to talk to you about those things. And the reception for the Collaboration Showcase is tonight at 515. So really, what I would say is, you know, we've done a lot to plan this for you, but what really makes it work is you making it count. So it's your job now to use those tools to make connections, to schedule social activities and invite others to join you, to talk to people at breaks, to go to those new session types, to you know, round people up and go see the bats on the Congress Street Bridge tonight. All of those things are up to you to make this your best experience. Talk to the people who are here. We won't know if you need help unless you ask, so please do. And last but certainly not least, enjoy this city. I know it's a rough, a rough haul to come to Austin, Texas where the weather's fantastic in the fall. Um, but I'm excited to be here for a number of reasons. Um, Sixth Avenue might be one of those reasons, but um, the breakfast tacos are number one. Um, <clears throat> But we're excited to be here mostly because Austin is a great city full of culture and community. It's very much like where I grew up, so it, it, it speaks to me on a personal level, and it speaks to what we're trying to do to create a community of folks who, who share a common culture of collaborating and making something. And I can't think of a better town to, that is conducive to that than Austin, Texas. You know, as we were planning to come to Austin, uh, the City of Austin Conventions Bureau assigned a cultural minister to us. We're excited to have him here, so I want everyone to, to welcome our cultural minister, and his name is Barry Freelove. This is awesome. I didn't know I was going to be invited to Woodstock 3. <laughs> this is killer. Look at all you. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. All right. Well, I'm here to welcome you to what I consider to be the greatest city in the world, and that's Austin, Texas. You know, here in Austin, we of course have a world-class music scene, which I'm sure many of you know about, that includes Austin City Limits and the Austin City Limits Music Festival, which just ended yesterday. Still recovering from that one, man. <laughs> we've also got world-class art scene here in town, and uh, we've got um, <laughs> all kinds of other scenes, too. Um, I don't know how that picture from my barbecue last weekend got in a slide deck, but... Now, here, we here in Austin, you know, we have a tight community. We really do take care of each other here in Austin. And we firmly believe in supporting our local businesses and our community. You know, if you've been around town, you've probably seen our uh, Keep Austin Weird t-shirts. Uh, they're a fixture here. It's difficult to see in this picture. Actually, it's difficult for me to see anything, but uh, at the bottom of the shirt in small letters, the fine print, if you will, it says, uh, support local businesses. And that's really our way of celebrating who we are here in Austin and the fact that we care about one another and we think a lot about our future together. And from what I understand, it's a lot like your community here, you know, the Koali community. Community source software, right? Right? That's awesome. That's just righteous. You know? You know, open source is really the way of the future. And, you know, looking around the room, it looks like the future's here. It's heavy, right? <laughs> well, to celebrate our kinship, uh, you know, and supporting our local communities, we here as part of the Austin tourism scene, we'd like to make a gesture to you and present you with a few boxes of our uh, Keep Koali Weird t-shirts. <laughs> they look great, don't they? <laughs> what? It says wired. Say again? It says wired. Oh. Uh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> How many boxes of those did you order? Uh, well, you know, it, you know, when you think about it, it's all right. Because by supporting your local institutions and the community, you really are helping keep Kuali wired, right? That's really heavy. 
So all you have to do to get your own Keep Koali Weird, I mean, oh, sorry, Keep Koali Wired t-shirt is to stop by the video booth in room 418 and just tell them why Koali is important to you. It'll only take a minute or two, it's easy, it's fun, and you'll have a nice memento of your trip here in Austin. So be sure to stop by the video booth, enjoy the city of Austin. Remember, we're in room 418. Enjoy your stay. Hey, don't do anything I wouldn't do. <laughs> See ya. Thank you, Barry. You know, and, and before I turn it over to the next speaker, I, want, um, I wanted to thank the people who put the conference together. So when I call your name, if you could stand up and everybody hold their applause until we're done. There are a lot of folks who worked on this conference. I know that I probably can't name all of them by name, but I'm going to give it a shot. Um, so for the planning committee, uh, Sarah Kristen from Cornell University, Mike Winkler, Matt Sargent, if you're in the room. Sarah and Matt will be your chair and vice chair for next year. Ron Splitgerber, the Kuali Foundation staff, Jennifer Foudy, Mike Almendinger, Leah Drickel, Cheryl Medley, um, the great staff at the registration desk for Concentra, uh, Jen Cummings and Deb Smith. And definitely last but not least, our track chairs. For Kuali Financial Systems, we have Valerie Monahan, Kevin Cronenbitter, Deborah Romano Connors. For Kuali Coeus, we have Dennis Pafrath and Lisa Oliva. For Kuali Olay, uh, Carlin Rushoff and Michelle Charbonneau. For KPME, Carla Espinosa and Sharon Thalen. For Rice, Matt Sargent and Sarah Kristen, so they've taken on double duties this year. For Student, uh, Tim Heidinger and Louise Lanabacher. For Mobility, Brian McGuff and Nate Jackson. And for Ready, Johnny Contardo. So for all of you, those of you who are standing, please give them a round of applause. They've done an amazing job. So, so next up is Brad Wheeler. Uh, he is the chair of the Kuali Foundation Board. He's the vice president for IT and the CIO at Indiana University. He's one of the Kuali founders and is great at reminding us and bringing us back to the reason we're here every day. So, Brad. Good morning. My remarks will be brief. We have a fantastic uh, panel to follow us, uh, follow after Chris uh, makes some awards in a few moments. But I do want to offer uh, a few comments as chair of the Quality Foundation Board and maybe a little bit of comments about my own responsibilities and what this community is enabling for Indiana University. Three things I want you to know today. The first one is very simple. The Quality Foundation is very healthy its finances, its management, its board, its audits, everything going on at the foundation is very healthy, our, our minutes are posted, um, so that's important to know because the foundation is the legal entity that holds the copyright for the software that uh, we're all producing together, sharing, and making it available to the world, and so it's important to know that we're very healthy. Time doesn't allow me to go through all of the eight projects and many of the things that are onboarding, but if you catch the sessions here, you can see the health of the projects and their implementations and release five of this and release four of that and the mobile app, you know that it's real. You can check your device right now and know that that's the real thing. So the projects are moving along. The more mature projects, you see lots of implementations. Our younger projects still working to get to those releases uh, on their roadmap, but a lot of good things going on there. I think perhaps more importantly than anything, though, would be point number two, and that is the context for higher education is uh, irrevocably changed. I think we spent a number of decades in higher ed administration that perhaps are summed up in the children's nursery rhyme where next verse, same as the first, and that we would go through a decade and resources would be good and there would be a few years of state or uh, financial austerity on returns on endowments, and we'd all cut and nip the budgets just a little bit and whine and cut back a little bit on travel, and then things eventually kind of got back to normal. Um, that is not going to happen in this decade. Those at state-funded institutions know this well. Those at the privates know that their resources are shifting uh, uh, as well. 
So the key point is we have got to make the, uh, the, uh, the business model of college and universities more efficient in going after its primary role of education and research for state universities increasingly a responsibility around economic development too. And the core means of doing that for most institutions is funding their core business, the research, the faculty, the new means of educating this move to online is not without its own expenses and development. And so we have got to reallocate from the cost of running our business to what our business actually is. And as a CIO, I can tell you there is no better means of doing that than what we're enabling in this community. Uh, I was stunned not too long ago to see that uh, a major university, their trustees and regents had approved an $83 million upgrade to PeopleSoft. That's an upgrade of a dot release. And I thought that decade was behind us. But I don't think it is behind us, but we've got to be informed to ask those questions. I don't think we can afford $83 million upgrades to much of anything for models that double down on the $83 million you're going to need down the road to upgrade it further. Uh, public record, $30 million of that went to consultants. Ouch. Yeah. So coming together is who we are. This is the week, began last week, of the Nobel laureates being announced. So every morning you're seeing about two more Nobel laureates announced. And you know, none of those people who are at the pinnacle, in many cases of their scientific or their scholarly discipline, did that completely by themselves. Science is a cumulative record. Universities, we are collaborative. It is what we do. And rather than thinking about working together to solve our very common administrative systems problems as, wow, that's a little weird. That's not how we've done it before. Frankly, that's normal. This is how scholars work. They do things together. They repurpose, they reuse, they build, and they improve. We're often in a bit of a situation like these three islands that you can see here of each campus leading and lagging the others, looking across the way and saying, oh my gosh, they put in mobility, we need mobility. And someone else saying, good grief, the NSF has new requirements for contracts and grants. We must have that software for contracts and grants. And rather than coming together to leverage our investments to reduce the cost of this enterprise, we end up in these asynchronous time investments that are propping up a cost of administration that this decade can no longer afford. So I'll leave you with a third point, and that is one to think about in this decade is how we work together. Uh, my good colleague, James Hilton, who is the CIO at the University of Virginia, James and I were some uh, of those involved in the early days of open source and launching Sakai. Lois Brooks is here as well. She was involved with that. And then Kowali came afterwards. And you know of a lot of the projects out there, Moodle and, and uh, uh, JSIC projects and such. So I think in this past decade, we learned a lot about how to work together. And we all made some mistakes, and we figured out some things that work well. But how do we harvest what we learn, just like a bunch of scientific experiments, so that the scholars of the future, we don't want to repeat the mistakes of the scholars of the past, we want to learn from them, and we want to make our work stronger. So in your conference packet, you find a, a paper there called The Architecture of Community, and that is the architecture of what makes our communities work. What are the, the girders and beams and concrete and scaffolding that builds strong, dynamic communities that we can rely on in a community of ideas, of lots and lots of new ideas coming along? Uh, Educause Review, this will be online in about 10 days. You have the advanced version of it. And uh, I don't want to give the, uh, the punchline away, but for CIOs and universities, it essentially says, we need to think about authority, who owns this stuff and how we make decisions and what matters about it. And we need to think about influence. 
So as we think about an options for authority and options for influence, what are the best, best paths to solve our challenges, our common challenges on the road ahead? And we believe there are communities of cooperation where we share stuff with fairly low stakes of interdependence. And there are communities of collaboration where we up the stakes because the outcomes and the timeliness and the functionality are more important. We've learned a lot over the last eight years in Kuali about how to have periods of cooperation, but most importantly, how to work together to collaborate to build software that we can become dependent upon. And I can tell you as the guy who, you know, is in trouble when stuff doesn't work at Indiana University with only 125,000 critics, uh, it matters a lot that we build really, really good stuff. Uh, it works. You'll hear about it in the sessions around the, the hallway and at institution after institution that is coming, that are coming together to build on our common goals and needs in a decade that is not the same verse that we have had before. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Chris Capola. Chris is a longtime member of the Kuali Foundation Board, has been elected multiple times. He is also the CEO of RSmart and has been involved since the word Kuali was first spoken. He is here to tell you about oh, some awards. Thanks, Brad. So uh, I get the honor of, uh, of doing the most important thing here in the, in the session, and that is recognizing a handful of people who have uh, set them apart among their colleagues and helping us all uh, recognize that. Lori mentioned earlier that, that people are the most important part of this community, uh, people building things specifically, and I think that's exactly right. And Brad was just talking about the purpose and the mission of this community, and uh, I think that's exactly right too. And uh, so I'm, I'm honored to be able to rec help us all recognize a handful of extraordinary people um, who are um, who are helping us um, by building things to achieve that that purpose. So uh, I'll start with uh, Terry Durkin. Terry, please come up. So every every year. We, uh, uh, we accept nominations from all of you to um, recognize a few people that, that really do uh, stand out and sort of set themselves apart with the uh, Golden Chopsticks Award. So unlike the chopsticks on your seats, these are golden chopsticks attached to a plaque. And Terry, thank you, congratulations. Thank you. So, I also want to share a few comments about um, about each of the award winners um, and uh, and why they were selected. You know, Terry has worked tirelessly on Kuali since um, really since Kuali started since the very beginning. Um, he, he started he began his Kuali life as a, a lead developer on the Kuali financial system. Uh, he participated in the uh, very first Kuali um, architecture meetings at uh, Indiana University. Um, you know, then he became the Kuali uh, Coeus Development Manager, uh, now serves as the Kuali Coeus Project Manager, um, and uh, in his leadership and his deep technical understanding of the Kuali architecture um, have been instrumental in helping the Kuali Coeus Project achieve, um, as Jennifer mentioned, functional equivalence with MIT uh, Coeus, um, and uh, and I'm certain that his leadership will continue to be very vital to the project going forward as, as it exceeds um, what MIT Coeus was. So uh, next, I'd like to invite Lori Schultz up here again. You're becoming quite the celebrity. <laughs> So you all, you all now know uh, Lori as the chair of uh, this year's Quality Days here in Austin, and 
you know, it's starting out uh, great. We're all really excited about it, especially that new start time, Lori, one of Lori's <laughs> innovations. Uh, so uh, some of you might not know that uh, Lori has also been part of the project since the very beginning. Uh, she's worked on both KFS, the financial system, um, and the research system, Koali Coeus. Uh, she served as a business analyst, as a lead subject matter expert, or SME, as uh, another acronym that you'll hear quite a bit uh, throughout this week. Uh, uh, she was recruited as the first chair of the Koali Coeus uh, Functional Council and served uh, in that role for several years. Uh, she's currently serving as the Koali Coeus Treasurer and uh, is the Koali Coeus representative on the Rice Application Roadmap Committee, which is the body that sets the direction for the uh, Koali Rice middleware in support of the Koali applications. Uh, Lori's leadership and guidance has also been instrumental in achieving Koali Coeus uh, functional equ equivalence um, on the uh, functional business side of the e equation. And last, I, I, I'd just uh, like to say from personal experience, I know that Lori is, um, in all of the variety of ways she contributes to this community, is just very generous with her time in helping new people into the community um, and doing really whatever it takes. Um, thank you, Lori. And, and next, Keiko Takahashi. from UC Irvine. So uh, if your institution is using KFS, uh, then chances are someone at your institution or probably multiple people at your institution have had the pleasure of working with, uh, with Keiko. Uh, Keiko's, uh, uh, this is becoming a theme, Keiko's been involved in, in the Kuali community since near the very beginning as well. Um, she uh, she was the first business analyst for the Kuali Financial System uh, project. Uh, and she played a leading role in most of the first implementations of the Kuali Financial System, including the very first implementation in Africa at uh, Strathmore University. Keiko has recently been a leader in the development of the Kuali uh, uh, Travel and Entertainment uh, module, which is in addition to the Quali uh, financial system, and is currently uh, helping to lead UC Irvine's implementation of Quali financials. I think that's what the flowers are for. Keiko's uh, breadth of, of uh, breadth and depth of, of knowledge about the Quali financial system is really amazing, and her enthusiasm is is contagious. Um, you know, Keiko has really. Um, set a very high bar for herself and, uh, and everyone she works with, she kind of brings up to that level. Keiko, thank you. So finally, I'd like to, I'd like to invite John Robinson up. I'm uh, very proud to recognize uh, uh, John for um, his contributions to the Kuali community. So John's uncommon vision and leadership were instrumental in the foundation of our, our community. John has spent most of his professional life um, working for the benefit of, of higher education. He started a company called Information Associates in 1968, and, uh, and in that started the first proprietary ERP system serving the education market. And uh, in fact, some of the institutions here today are, uh, have either recently replaced or are uh, in the process of replacing the financial system component of that ERP with Kuali Financials. Take an extra round of applause for that. 
in the in the early 2000s, John and a handful of others, Barry Walsh and and uh, and a few others that that shared this vision for what the Kuali community could become. They had the you know, fortitude to, to um, drive it and help us make it happen. Um, over the past decade, uh, since that started, you know, John, has, you know, his personal commitment, his personal investment in helping us achieve, you know, all we can be as a community has just been unwavering. He's, he continues to be a, a champion for this community's potential and our successes nationally and internationally. John, thank you. So, Kuali is, is clearly about people, and uh, you know, thank you for helping me recognize these four uh, people that really stand out as extraordinary com contributors uh, to this community and our purpose. Um, our community is full of great people, so I want to just take an extra um, opportunity, you know, give yourselves a hand, everyone who's contributing to the Kuali community, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Now, I, it gives me great pleasure to make a little bit of a transition here in our general session, and I'm going to invite our three distinguished panelists to come up to the stage. And they're going to speak to you. We got a lot of feedback last year, um, especially from newcomers, that what they really wanted to hear was from distinguished leaders in the community about the why Kuali and even some people who have been in the community for a while. And so it gives me great pleasure to introduce three very distinguished speakers for our keynote panel. And they're both old timers and newcomers, so I think we'll get a very good perspective. We have Pat Burns, the VP for Information Technology and the Dean of the Libraries at Colorado State University. We have Eric Denna, the CIO at the University of Utah. And we have Spencer Golden, um, Director of Enterprise Systems for Haverford College. I'm going to turn it over to them, and I'm sure they're going to share some wonderful ideas and experiences with us. Pat. Thank you, Jennifer. Good morning. Hey, we're a community. We're all here about ourselves, and you can do better than that. Good morning. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you all. So our presentation continues the theme of the morning. It's the money, oh, and it's the software, oh, and it's the community. So we're going to talk about what we think we are in higher ed currently. And our current perspective is as follows. How many of you remember the Spellings Commission report in 2006 that wanted to change higher ed into K-12? <laughs> And we've seen a number of messages from the Chronicle. University leaders de desperately need to transform how we do business. The future of higher education and other imponderables, there's great uncertainty right now in terms of our future. The digital scholar rethinking higher education business models to echo and follow on to what Brad said. Emory University is gonna close three departments as part of restructuring where Emory has the 13th largest endowment of any institution in the world, and they're doing that. And there's a lot of buzz about student debt and confrontation of new costs, and you can see it's even in the popular literature, the New York Times. Obama and both presidential candidates are talking about the cost of higher ed not being sustainable. And the Pew Research Center Agree or disagree, college costs in general are such that most people can afford to pay for a college education. 75% disagree. Here's a map of all of higher ed, and the ones shown shaded are the states cutting higher ed budgets in 2011. How many of you are from a shaded state? Yeah, look at that. And then the NSF came out with a report raising alarm over falling state support for research universities just a month ago. And that's the University of Colorado just down the street from us. Colorado may be the first state in the nation to defund public higher education. 
sequestration may be upon us. We're looking at another 109 billion of mandated cuts in 2013. And here's something that fascinated me. We're going after donors to sponsor individual classes now. Are we going to be able to teach our classes? Let's see who would donate to that class. Gracious. And I like the onion. Recession plague nation demands new bubble to invest in. <laughs> There's a lot of sentiment that that new bubble might be higher education. And the big question of 2011 is who needs college? The Theo Fellowship pays 24 talented students $100,000 not to attend colleges. What kind of society are we becoming? That was from the Chronicle. We know about MOOCs. Where are they going, and how are they going to affect our business model and our economies in our institutions? Bills on the table in several states include limits on salaries, sabbaticals, and collective bargaining. So legislatures are micromanaging higher ed because of the situation we find ourselves in. The perfect storm. State support is going down. Student tuition is going up. Student debt is going up. Federal support, one could argue, is going down, including for research and probably Pell Grants. We don't know how much yet, but that's probably true. And higher ed is under attack from multiple constituencies. The professoria is shrinking. Tenure is in danger. We are experiencing brain drain as a country for the first time in forever, basically, since World War II anyway. How will we as a country attract and retain the best talent? And where is the value proposition for higher education today? It's being questioned from multiple fronts. And then we see things coming out like how much are students learning? How many of you have read Academically Adrift? If you haven't read that, you should read that. It scare the hell out of you. It says that not very much. And again, the Pew Research Center, the value of a college education, 57% think it's only fair or poor of our citizenry. So are we going to be epitomized by this slide? I hope not. So how should a CIO react? Reducing one of our largest expenses, so self-determination in administrative systems, that's what Kuali is all about, right? by higher ed for higher ed. If we adopt community source products, and in particular, we can leverage them over multiple campuses and even multiple institutions via shared services across multiple institutions and multiple campuses, we can keep millions of dollars in college budgets. And just to follow on to what Brad said. So what we're going to talk about today are three very different institutions implementing community source. There are CSU on the left, 1,500 faculty, Haverford, 150, University of Utah, close to 2,000. You can see the range in numbers of students and number of staff. The annual budgets range from 80 million to 1.4 billion. State support goes from zero to something a little bit bigger than that. <laughs> and look at the range of IT budgets. We at CSU are best of breeds in our administrative systems, Haverford's legacy, and University of Utah is PeopleSoft. You can see the difference in sizes of IT staff. And the point here is we're covering essentially the entire spectrum of higher ed institutions. And so we're so different, it brought to mind, there's, this is a road sign of a small town in Colorado. And this is true. I saw this about 20 years ago, and unfortunately, I forget the name of the town and didn't snap a picture. But it's basically taking apples, oranges, and kiwi fruit and totaling them. <laughs> Let's take a look at KFS implementations at CSU and Haverford and, and University of Utah is um, also exploring that. One of the big things that uh, were made it uh, successful for us is we had presidential leadership and visioning. Our president was thinking about the things on those first 10 slides four years ago when we decided to implement. What's nice is we didn't have to do an RFP for a system. We had to do it for consulting services, but that's far easier. That saved me at least six months of time. 
we had a great commercial affiliate, and there are great commercial affiliates to help you, and, and they add tremendous value. Our implementation cost was not 1.9 million at CSU. Spencer will talk about his. And our ongoing costs are far less than they would be for a vendor-supported system. Our FTE staffing, um, we're still implementing uh, revisions of KFS and trying to integrate with Rice and Coeus. But we've been through three year ends with Quali Financial System and they've been successful. So talking about our implementation, the first thing to start off with is the reality triangle. We're about a community that builds software. So there's no better functionality you're gonna get than Quali software because it's by higher ed for higher ed. And with better software, it saves you money and it saves you time. And in fact, all three of these things trade off against each other. When we went to our president and tried to sell the concept of community source, we used this triangle to sell it to him. And to quote one of our distinguished politicians, we sold it to him with one word, and that word was arithmetic. <laughs> we basically, using better software and the community source model, kept millions of dollars in college budgets, and we got better software along with it. So what's wrong with that? And we implemented it in a shorter time period. So it is indeed better software. So, oh, it's the software. <laughs> we went live on July 1st, 2009, and it was on a pre-release version of KFS. We would never have done that without, with, with vendor software. We went live because the community all around the country stepped up and helped us go live. And after we went live, they supported it better too. So, oh, it's the community. The 1.9 million implementation, 150K per year in maintenance because we're a KFS sustainability partner. So, oh, it's the money. We all have seen the project hype cycle before where there's the technology trigger and positive hype and the peak of inflated expectations and then the negative hype and the trough of disillusionment. <laughs> and then we go up the slope of enlightenment and plateau on the plateau of productivity. So that's from the Gartner Group. And I showed this at the Yukon kickoff days. This is the misery bucket. Well, we all know that no large IT system implementation is an IT project. It's a functional project that IT supports. But we've been through three of these in the last 10 years, and there's a full bucket of misery that comes along with every large-scale system implementation, and you have to eat it. You have to eat it all, and you're not done until you eat it all. You can eat it fast, or you can eat it slow, but you have to eat it and you have to eat it all. So there, you can see where our bucket of misery was in the trough of disillusionment. That is our uh, project cycle overlaid on the project hype cycle. <laughs> and you know, you have to plan for, you know, a one to two year implementation or so, and then you have to plan for a year of sweep up after that, and that, you gotta eat that whole bucket of misery. <laughs> So KFS was our most successful implementation effort. Yes, we did it and we succeeded and it's really great software. So we're gonna look at quality systems first in terms of all of our future projects. And our message to you is come on in, the water's fine and you don't even have to dip your toe in, you can dive in unlike the mountain streams of Colorado. Now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce my colleague and friend, Spencer from Haverford. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, I got it on the first try. Okay. So, so I'm going to uh, go back a couple of slides, if I can. So that's a pretty interesting slide. Um, pretty wide range. You've all probably figured out by now, Haverford is a pretty small institution, 1,200 students. There was talk um, about five years ago of expanding it to 1,400, and the alumni went crazy and we gave that up. <laughs> um, I can say that because I'm one of those alumni. Um, anyway, so it's a small institution and a lot of the um, constraints that 
higher ed find itself under are doubled and tripled in, in small institutions with limited um, endowments. So if we look at this, if we look at this slide, um, I actually am relatively new to Haverford, came about a year and a half ago. And um, before I joined, I was talking with the president and he was taught, I, I came from, I actually came not from higher ed, but from the corporate world. And he was talking about this, uh, this new system that the CIO was talking about uh, possibly bringing in called Kuali and never heard of it, didn't, had no idea what it was, but it was clear that the president had, um, had drunk the Kool-Aid and realized that Kuali represented something different not just for large institutions like Colorado State, but for small places like Haverford College. So um, shortly after that, I joined and um, along with, with the CIO, helped, um, helped bring the rest of the institution on board for the idea of community source software and specifically um, Kuali Financial System. So um, as you can see, the, uh, uh, I, I wanna say, Pat, your implementation cost is only twice as much as ours, and you're more than twice as big as we are, so I'm very impressed with what you've accomplished. But uh, I think we've done pretty well as well. Um, so let me go back to my slides. Okay, so the reality triangle. I've expanded the triangle a little bit. Looks a little bit like a square now. Um, that, was, that was on purpose. So, Let's talk about time. So, so we had a board mandate at Haverford um, that we had to replace our legacy system. It was 30 years old and barely met audit requirements and certainly did not meet user requirements. So time was critical. Um, functionality, we needed to do everything larger schools do, only we needed to do it with less people. And of course, dollars. We, um, Haverford traditionally, until recently, had spent almost nothing on... Um, on things like infrastructure, systems infrastructure and applications, we got along with our 30-year-old custom-built system for years and years and years. So although we changed that model, uh, Joe Spadaro, the CIO, and I, with help from myself and others, helped change that model, but um, it's still limited dollars. And then finally, collaboration. So the bottom line is, a school like us, small liberal arts school, we can't do something as robust and as, um, as really model changing as Kuali without help, help from the community, of which we got a ton, both before we decided to go with KFS and after we started implementing, and even now when we're done implementing. Um, and in collaboration with other schools, we, we, um, we have a tight, a tight uh, relationship with a sister school called Bryn Mawr College down the road, and although they're not on Kuali, um, when we decided to move forward, the intent was that we'll jump in the water and, um, and they will, will hopefully follow suit shortly. So collaborating together on applications as well as other IT initiatives is key to a small school like us making progress. In fact, right now, um, while we're here, uh, St. Olaf and Carlton from Minnesota are, are both at Haverford uh, right now talking with, with our folks about how we collaborate with our local um, brother and sister consortium schools in order to do more with less. Okay, so we, we, just, we uh, had to make a choice. What are we going to do? So we, we basically, we didn't do a full, a full RFP by any stretch, but we looked at three types of options. We looked at the robust tier one commercial systems, the people sauce of the world, the banners, we looked at um, smaller, less robust, less expensive commercial software. In our case, it was um, Blackboard's Financial Edge, mainly because our sister school was using them. And then we looked at Kuali as um, sort of the future, more strategic approach of a community sourced, robust, and continually evolving opportunity for us to improve the way we do things at Haverford. So um, it it, it took a while, there was a lot of um, sturm and drang as we, as we worked across campus, functional and technical people, to, um, to figure out what the right answer was within our constraints. But eventually, once everyone sort of realized what Kuali and KFS had to offer, our selection committee um, came to a unanimous conclusion to move forward with KFS. 
So real quick uh, project timeline. The board mandate came in the fall of 2010. In um, July of 2011, uh, I came on board and, and helped drive uh, the final decision to go forward with KFS. We kicked the project off in September, did some sort of soft planning for a month or two, um, and then uh, the, uh, the real work started in November. We trained folks in June, we went live in July. So that's eight or nine months of real work for the implementation, pretty fast. Um, we are small, so that helps. We were um, working off of um, less than ideal processes, so we were open to changing our processes, and that helps. Um, and finally, we had the support of the community. We had the, um, the KCAs who were there to support us. We ended up using Navigator Management Partners, and they were great. Um, but the community as a whole, we really felt that they viewed Haverford's implementation as an opportunity. We came right on the heels of Stevens, which was the first small school, and we, and, but we were even smaller and, and, and less technical, and, and the community came together to help us and make sure that we were going to be successful because they wanted to prove, and we wanted to prove, that this would work for a school like Haverford and others similar. So uh, bottom line is we did it for about, for under a million dollars, kept it to six figures, and um, a, a large part of that was consulting expenses. Um, a, a significant part, maybe 15% of that, was simply um, backfill costs to, to bring in staff to do regular jobs while our people um, worked on the project. Um, so we had temporary staff increase. We had no permanent staff increase, and we're pretty proud of that. Um, at, at, a, at a place like Haverford with limited budgets, um, getting approval to hire a new permanent hire is, uh, is extraordinarily difficult in these times. But um, bottom line is the software was the right robust software for any school, large or small. The community was there to help us, and they really did. And the money, we, we, could, we, couldn't, uh, we couldn't turn down the fact that we could do this, get the robust software we needed far for far less money than uh, we would have spent had we gone with a people software banner or another commercial vendor. So um, we really had a goal. I had a personal goal to prove to Haverford and to the greater world that we could do this, that a small school with a limited budget and very limited time, because our mandate said we had to have something that worked up and running by the end of fiscal year 12. So I, I really, I, I was going to prove that we could do this with Kuali, we could do it successfully, and that others can do it as well. And, um, the reason we're, I'm here and many of my colleagues are to spread that word and uh, hopefully get um, folks to uh, join us, jump in the water, and join the party. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, my colleague, Eric Denna, from University of Utah, to talk about a possibly up and coming. I've noticed the clock, and I've got to hurry. So um, Pat, may, Pat uh, painted a pretty interesting picture about the, the situation that we find ourselves in in higher ed. And it reminded me of a recent uh, little vacation that I took with my father and brothers. Now, you may look at this picture and say, vacation? <laughs> this is Smoke Creek, California, where my dad grew up. And we gather here every year to go back and let my dad reminisce and, and kind of tour around the area. Um, you'll notice that it's not a lot like Austin. There's not a lot of foliage, but there's a lot of rock. It's pretty rough terrain. The question I'd ask you is if you were driving through Smoke Creek, which car would you pick? Now here's the interesting thing. You can actually, with enough time and money, you can turn a Ferrari into an off-road vehicle. This is actually a Ferrari Baja. Uh, so the, the question you may be tempted to ask yourself is, do we have enough time and money to turn that, to turn a Ferrari into a Ferrari Baja? I would ask, is that really the most important question? Do we have enough time and money? 
let me tell you a little bit about the University of Utah and uh, where we find ourselves and the recent decision that we've made. So, people, so the U is one of the original PeopleSoft schools. University of Michigan, University of Utah, a few other, a handful of schools invested in this, um, in the software. Very conservatively speaking, and many have told me when I've shown them this figure of $75 million, they say that I'm about 50% under. So a lot of people would say we've spent over $100 million on PeopleSoft over the last decade plus. One of the more interesting things is in an effort to turn this Ferrari into a Baja, we've made over 18,000 modifications to PeopleSoft. Now I told the guys to stop counting. I think I see Joe out there in the crowd. I said, just stop counting. I think we've made our point. I've yet to find anyone who comes close to us in the number of modifications. I think we win the prize. I'm not sure what that prize is, but um, I think we won it. So when I, when I first came on board, we started asking a lot of questions about, so what are we going to do? What, what, where we find ourselves, are we going to make it? Are we going to buy it? Are we going to customize? Are we going to adapt? You know, you, you know the drill. Every time some software decision comes up, we start asking ourselves these questions. <clears throat> This all led to an interesting conversation over the summer with our president. I came to Kuali Days a year ago in Indianapolis. And I left. There was actually a group of us that came, uh, some people from finance, from HR, um, no one from student. When I left, I turned to my functional partners and said, so, so what do you think? And frankly, I wasn't getting a lot of traction with finance and HR. But I found myself in a conversation with our new um, Associate Vice President of Strategic Enrollment in Student Affairs. And she had a vision about where she wanted to go with student uh, services into the future and had uh, the Vice President of Student Affairs right there with her. We started talking about uh, joining the Kuali student effort. All of that culminated in a conversation with our president, a new president at the University of Utah, who's a computational scientist. I mean, he gets technology. He understands this stuff. I found myself in this interesting moment in our conversation where Dave, our, our president, asked me this question. I want to invest in my priorities. Why don't we just fix our PeopleSoft mess? And it was, it was one of those moments where all the oxygen was kind of sucked out of the room and everyone was kind of looking at me saying, Eric, why can't you fix the PeopleSoft mess? And I asked Dave, I said, Dave, I'm not sure that's the right question. And he kind of looked at me like, okay, smarty pants, what's the right question? <clears throat> what model do you want to invest in for the next 10 years? That turned the whole conversation, and the result of that is this. The University of Utah has joined Kuali Rice as an investing partner in Kuali Student. This is a presidential priority. <clears throat> We're starting the conversations about KFS and KPME, but have not made those decisions yet. But I hope that under the, the fact that we're jumping into uh, Kuali Student, which is um, not a completed project, I hope shows our commitment that we're all in on Kuali and, uh, and very excited about what the future holds. So thank you. So we've been asking ourselves for some time now, so this is a great community to join, and it saves so much money and produces better software. Where is the stampede? So certainly, I think we need to be feel we need to head toward a Kuali ERP, even though Gartner and other analysts are saying nowadays that best of breed is obtaining favor over ERPs because of all the service-oriented architectures and the things that they enable. Those are some additional quality projects as well that you, one might consider joining and investing in. So let's talk about compare and contrast now. 
The Koala motivation is to build community. We com build community via community source software systems and implementations, as opposed to the vendor motivation, which is to increase profit. And the functional comparison, we've seen that Koali produces better code versus some of the legacy code that we've seen. Uh, and I can tell you some horror stories if you corner me somewhere. And, and our uh, implementation was speedy, and, and you know, Spencer's was exceptionally speedy. And uh, vendor implementations have been, shall we say, more deliberate. And what really drove it home to me was we've been through three best of breed large scale system implementations in the last 10 years. And when we were vendor systems, the staff were not smiling. They were quite distressed at times and most of the time. Our staff felt that they were part of a community, part of something bigger than themselves. They were more productive and they were happier and they smiled throughout our KFS implementation. And that made a huge impact. And that was the functional staff as well as the IT staff. And in fact, it, it was a university project. It wasn't an IT project and it wasn't a finance project. It was a university project. And we were happy going through that, even while eating that bucket of misery. And so the question is, where do we wish to be in 2020? It's Eric's question uh, to his president. And so we are instituting the Koali Pick One initiative. Take these brown chopsticks that you have. Everybody hold them up, please. And look at them. Gaze upon them. There is nothing written on them. These chopsticks are for you to take back and put on your desks and to pick a Koali system. Pick one. If you aren't in Koali already, use these to remind you to pick one. If you're already doing a Koali system, pick another one. <laughs> it's time to double down. Higher education is entering a different era. Our presidents are going to look to every VP and say, what can you do? They're going to point at us, I guarantee you, and say, what can you do to make higher education more affordable in the next decade? What can you do to provide better online functionality and better self-service? Look at these chopsticks and answer the question yourselves. I think that's what we have for today. So we'll be around. Treasure these chopsticks and motivate yourselves into action via them. Thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you, panel, and all of the speakers today will be here up front. Um, we have a few minutes to, as we close the session, I have a couple of announcements, and then I have one more person I want to invite to the podium. I think you'll be excited about what she has to say to you. Um, there is a cancellation tomorrow at 3.30. There was a session, Ole Cultural Heritage. The presenter was unable to make a flight. They got canceled, and they can't be here. So I apologize that session has been canceled. So, I want to invite Sarah Kristen to the podium. Sarah, as you know, is our Kowali Days 2013 chair. And even though we're just starting on Kowali Days 2012, I want you to be thinking about next year. So, Sarah's from Cornell. She's already given her time this year. It's going to give a lot of good time next year to make a great Kowali Days 2013. So, Sarah, tell us about it. Thank you, Jennifer. So I get the privilege of introducing uh, Quality Days 2013 to all of you. It's going to be in San Diego next year, um, and a lot of you may have been to Quality Days in San Diego uh, several years ago. It was a great place to have the conference. It's going to be at the Sheridan San Diego Hotel and Marina, um, November 18th through the 21st. Conference planning is, is just getting started now. Matt Sargent, Matt, are you out there? He's going to be the vice chair. Um, the conference committee is going to be starting uh, planning sort of much, and much more intensely after this conference wraps up. Um, one of the things we really want to do is to focus on feedback from this year's conference. So be sure to fill out the evaluations um, and share your feedback with us. Um, and one of the things that I want to sort of put a pitch out there for now is track chairs. We need track chairs for all of the different tracks. Um, it's a great way to get involved, um, to understand how the conference works. Um, so I encourage you to do that. 
Um, what can you expect from next year's conference? You can learn all about the different applications, the different quality applications. We'll have the collaboration showcase where you can learn what other schools and our KCAs are doing. And we'll have lots of uh, networking opportunities for you. So if you're still trying to decide if Quality Days 2013 is for you, I have a couple um, facts and photos for you. San Diego is the second largest city in California, uh, seventh largest city in the United States. It's a great city. Um, there's over 70 miles of beach for you to explore while we're there. Um, the Hotel Coronado is just across the bay, actually very close to the, um, to the hotel where we're going to be. It's the largest wooden structure in the United States. Um, this ship, the Star of India, uh, resides in the San Diego Harbor. It's the oldest functioning ship um, in the world. And finally, um, lots of people know about San Diego for the San Diego Zoo. There's over 3,700 uh, animals there, 650 different species, including the giant panda that we've all heard about. So I look forward to seeing you all in San Diego next year. Um, and one last pitch to volunteer. If you have ideas, um, things you'd like to help out with, if you want to be a track chair, this uh, Matt and I's um, email addresses are here. Or if you see us walking around over the next couple of days, feel free to stop us and uh, let us know what you're thinking or how you'd like to help out. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Sarah. We'll look forward to that. I should mention, please introduce yourself to Sarah and Matt, and please volunteer. We like to get new people coming in to get to doing the track chair and the program committee and, and, and give us new feedback. And I will also say that Matt tends to come to these in a different mode of transportation than the rest of us. He comes on his motorcycle, so he may organize with you from wherever you are getting to San Diego in a new and different way. So introduce yourself to Sarah and Matt. I leave you now. Have a great conference. Great Koali Days 2012.